Καλησπέρα, Φρόσο. Okay, shall we start then? Great, Kalispera Seolus. Good evening, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the ninth Zoom lecture of the 55th public lecture series, celebrating 30 years of research at the Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus. It is my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, one of the newest members of the ARU, Dr. Michalis Olympios, Associate Professor in the History of Western Art in the Department of History and Archaeology, where he has been teaching since 2011. Michalis holds a degree in History and Archaeology from the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens, as well as an MA and a PhD in the History of Art from the Cotold Institute of Art of the University of London. In 2012 to 2014, he was visiting research associate at the Center of Hellenic Studies, King's College London, while in 2018, he was a guest scholar at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. His research revolves around the history of medieval art and architecture in Western Europe and the Latin East, view, viewed through a variety of methodological lenses, ranging from archival research to object-based investigations. He has published widely on Gothic architecture and sculpture in Northwest France, Cyprus, Rhodes and Crete, focusing, focusing on issues of as diverse as stylistic pluralism in the art of Eastern Mediterranean, of the of Eastern Mediterranean from the central Middle Ages to early modernity, the construction through art of social and institutional memory and identity, the mise-en-scene of medieval saints, cults and the interior disposition and liturgical apparatus of late medieval churches. His monograph on Gothic church, church architecture in Lusignan, Cyprus, was published in 2018 in Brepols, 
while his latest publications concern the particularities of the adoption of the Gothic style by non-elite communities in medieval Cyprus, Gothic art in Nicosia and the reconstruction of the liturgical furnishings of the Papal Collegiate Church of Saint, Saint Urbain et Trois. Current projects include the study of the impact of the Lusinian past on 16th century uh, historicist architecture in Famagusta and the reassessment of the architectural history of the Church of the Collège de Bernardin in Paris in collaboration with Chris Schabel. He has taken part in collaborative research projects in Cyprus and France. In 2017 to 2018, he coordinated an AG Leventis Foundation project on the history of the Bedestan, namely Nicosia's medieval Greek cathedral of the Panagia Odigitria. The results of this endeavor, to be presented in a multi-author volume, are currently being prepared for publication. His co-founder, a current co-editor co with Chris Abel of Brill's Francocratia, a journal for the study of Greek lands under Latin rule, now in its second volume, and a member of the editorial board for Breppel's Mediterranean Nexus 1100 to 1700 series. Before I give the Zoom floor to Michalis, I would like to kindly ask you to um, keep your microphones muted during the presentation and your cameras off. You, can, you may switch them on again uh, during the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Michali. Well, thank you so much, Tanasi, for this wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone who's here tonight with me. Um, uh, it's wonderful to see you again after all this time. Now give me a few minutes to just, um, or rather a few moments to share my screen with you. Mm -hmm. All right. So can you all see the, uh, the slides yes. now? That's right, yes. Wonderful. All right then. So um, as my colleague has just reminded us, 2021 marks the 30 year anniversary of the foundation of the archaeological research unit of the University of Cyprus. It also represents a personal milestone of sorts. For almost exactly 10 years ago, I was fortunate enough to join this wonderfully dynamic group of researchers and to share in its vision, efforts, and successes. Anniversaries and milestones invariably predispose one to self-reflection. And indeed, tonight I have opted not to regale you with tales of molding profiles and moldy archives as is my want, but we discuss a series of more theoretical questions that have been on my mind for close to a decade now. During the job interview for the post I now hold, a member of the hiring committee took issue with my use of the term hybrid to describe what I saw as subtle stylistic incongruities in the form of some colonnette capitals in one of my earliest articles. They asserted that hybrid should only be employed to denote the mashup of two, two completely different and immediately distinguishable things. I admittedly do not recall my response to that comment. My mind was otherwise preoccupied at the time, yet I remained more than a little perplexed about the skepticism shown towards the use of a fairly commonplace term that in my naivete, I embraced without thinking twice. In the 10 years that followed, I had some time to think and on occasion present my thoughts on how 19th to 21st century scholarship has perceived cross-cultural contact and artistic interchange in the liminal space of the medieval and early modern Eastern Mediterranean. In tonight's talk, I will endeavor to discuss how concepts such as hybridity and transculturality and the diverging conceptualizations of cultural intermingling and renewal for which they stand have been called upon to help assess artistic production in the Latin East and to offer my thoughts on the legitimacy of such nomenclature for the purpose at hand and on plausible alternatives. So a word of warning to everyone, this is going to be a highly selective uh, paper in its treatment of its subject matter and uh, somewhat self-indulgent as well, but um, just bear with me. In the wake of the Crusades launched to regain control of the Holy Land from Islam, and the great expansion of Latin Christendom eastwards from the 11th to the 14th centuries. A number of Latin ruled polities were established on the territory of modern day Israel, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Cyprus, Turkey, and Greece. Of these newly founded states and former Muslim and Byzantine lands, some were short lived affairs, such as the Kingdom of Thessaloniki, 1204 to 1224, and the Latin Empire of Constantinople, 1204 to 1261. 
Others remained under constant threat from inimical external forces, such as the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, 1099 to 1291, and the Principality of Achaia in the Morea, that is in the Peloponnese, 1205 to 1430. Yet others, for instance, Lusignan and Venetian Cyprus, 1192 to 1571, and Venetian Crete, 1211 to 1669, enjoyed a long and relatively peaceful existence before being annexed to the growing Ottoman Empire. All of these political and uh, territorial entities were home to complex societies composed of variegated ethno-religious constituents that included the Franks, namely the Latin elite, primarily of French or Italian descent, the Greeks, the Syrians, further subdivided into Melkites, Nestorians, Jacobites, and Maronites, the Armenians, and other Eastern Christian rites, together with Jews and Muslims. Recent advances in social history have demonstrated that the boundaries between these different social groups were not rigid and immutable, and they shifted markedly with time. Thus, it has been shown that by the 14th century, considerable rapprochement had been achieved between Latins, Greeks, and Syrians at the highest social echelons in the Peloponnese, Cyprus, and Crete through intermarriage or other means of social mobility. Eventually, identity markers such as Latin and Greek seemingly came to hold less meaning for the nobility than the feeling of belonging to an exclusive privileged caste, which despite its ethnic and creedal heterogeneity, identified with the common Moreot, Cypriot, or Cretan Christian identity. In other words, although the multi-hued societies of the Latin East existed at the intersection of the Western European and Byzantine worlds, the hierarchical layering of these two cultural spheres was not completely airtight. And given time, Partial bleeding between layers did occur, resulting in new mixed or composite social actors and groups. Questions of this kind pertaining to the porosity and permeability of social boundaries in the Eastern Mediterranean during the late medieval and early modern periods were not to become part of the methodological arsenal of medieval historians until relatively late in the 20th century. When the serious and systematic study of the history of the Latin East first began in the 19th century, it was inextricably bound up with that of the crusade movement, which was regarded as a resounding national achievement, especially by French historiography. Showcasing medieval France's colonialist claim over the crusader states founded in the East was of the essence here, laying the stress squarely on the Latin ingredient of the aforementioned Mediterranean social and cultural melange. After all, the designation Latin East, which emerged into the limelight in 1875, with the foundation of the Société de l'Orient Latin by the deeply Catholic Count Paul Rion, was conceived as a pendant to the umbrella term Latin West. I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, something came up on the screen right here. It says that the host has asked me to start my video. I don't know if that's a problem or not. Not at all, just click OK. All right. The camera is Michali. Is this all right? Yes, that's uh -huh. fine. Okay, wonderful. All right then. So after all the designation Latin East, which emerged into the limelight in 1875 with the foundation of the Société de l'Orient Latin by the deeply Catholic Count Paul Rion, was conceived as a pendant to the umbrella term Latin West, applied to all of post-Roman Europe to imply a degree of political, cultural, and above all, religious unity from one end of the Mare Nostrum to the other. There was no place for social fragmentation and dissenting voices in the grand narrative of France's heroic eastward march. As we shall see presently, early art historical research on the architectural and artistic production of the Latin East exhibited the same nationalist and colonialist bias, exacerbated by entrenched preconceptions and the analytical tools germane to the development of the discipline itself in its early days. From its inception as an academic branch of learning in the 19th century, art history relied heavily on the adoption of the methodology and terminology of the biological sciences in approaching and studying its subject matter. Works of art and architecture began to be dissected and broken down into their component parts, which were then classified according to formalist principles. 
In a far more rigorous manner than the early attempts of either a Vasari or a Winkelmann, such taxonomies provided ample scope for comparative analysis between different objects, regions, and periods, leading to more or less well-defined and coherent groups of formal traits or trends identified with individual workshops, schools, or styles. In the course of the 19th and the early 20th centuries, this quasi-scientific practice of art history evolved in tandem with the nationalist and colonialist mindsets prevailing among historians of all stripes and under the seductive influence of the romantic fallacy of so-called period styles. As a result, individual artistic styles were equated with particular cultures, thought to have flourished during specific time periods within well-circumscribed geographical ambits. This marriage of form and cultural come national context was applied to even the most minute details of artworks and buildings, <laughs> essentially converting them into agglomerations of parts often viewed as emanating from or belonging to different Kunstlandschaften or artistic landscapes and coming together in either harmonious or dissonant mixtures, depending on the circumstances. Casting visual form in national terms essentially opened the door for varied readings of works of art and architecture as mirrors of a nation's instantly recognizable, imminent and unchanging character, which were drafted to affirm its internal coherence and unity, or its cultural and political supremacy over its neighbors and rivals. The first generation of French scholars to have dealt in a systematic and serious fashion with the art of the Crusades and the Latin East did so in this ideologically charged intellectual climate. Camille Onlard, whose seminal work on the Romanesque and Gothic monuments of Greece, Cyprus, and the Syro-Palestinian Crusader states, remains a fundamental point of reference in its field, sought to write the history of the artistic forays of medieval France into the Eastern Mediterranean to educate his compatriots on a neglected aspect of their nation's political and cultural achievements. Onla's nationalist streak shows, for instance, in his unbridled enthusiasm for the Gothic cathedral churches of Lusignan, Cyprus, the almost unmitigated French Frenchness of which he considered to be the hallmark of top of the tier craftsmanship. Like Charles Jean Melchior de Vaudier and Emmanuel Guillaume Rey, uh, he conceived of the island kingdom's high profile uh, architectural heritage as a Western graft onto an unsuspecting Eastern landscape with which it barely interacted in any meaningful way. By contrast, Onla abhorred Gothic churches in Greece under Latin rule, which he judged to suffer from weak, poor, and barbarous design, all words used by him in his articles. The problem here lay in the subpar work of local masons trained in Byzantine architectural traditions who misunderstood and misrepresented their French Gothic models. Thus, Onla extols the beauty of the Middle Byzantine Church of the Dormition of the Virgin at Daphne in Attica, but disparages the architectural poverty of its quote unquote colonial Western porch built after the edifice's acquisition by the Cistercian order in the early 13th century. Furthermore, the French savant compared unfavorably the 13th century bell towers of the Benedictine Abbey Church of saint Niquet at Reims um, in the Champagne, now destroyed, with the 15th century belfry of the Church of the Pandana Saint Mistras in the Peloponnese, which he called a, quote, monstre bizadinocotique, end quote. On last vocal endorsement of pure, perfect artistic styles over aberrant mixtures, marred by imperfections, is a constant in his work, which sees the combination of artistic traditions as an invariably late stage in the art of Greece and Cyprus marked by aesthetic decline. However, it should be acknowledged that Onla's ideologically tinted narrative did not exclusively concern the art of the Latin East in the Central and Late Middle Ages, for in fact, he applied the same methodology to the other medieval artistic traditions he considered to be offshoots of French art, namely those of Germany, Great Britain, Scandinavia, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Syria. At the other end of the spectrum, early 20th century Byzantinists tackling the art of the Latin ruled Eastern Mediterranean also showed a marked preference for pure styles often shaped by nationalist convictions. Giorgio Sotiriu and somewhat later Andreas and Judith Stiglianou 
downplayed the impact of any Western influences on the Byzantine art of Cyprus, stressing the uninterrupted continuity of local Greek Cypriot culture, which survived uncontaminated by the cultural novelties introduced by its conqueror and oppressor. Where this artistic purity could not be comfortably demonstrated, as in the so-called Franco-Byzantine works of architecture and sculpture discussed by Sotiriu and Andreas Xinkopoulos, to which we will return later, the mixture was rationalized as a bold expression of Greek identity and progressive ascendancy under the yoke of Latin domination. Antoine Bon, a classicist turned Byzantinist, whose magnum opus on the Frankish Morea, that is the Principality of Achaia, was submitted as a doctoral thesis in 1951, only to be published several years later in 1969, went even further in his assessment of Frankish ecclesiastical building activity in the Peloponnese. Bon argued that churches such as those of Zaraka, Isova, or Andravida, designed for the Latin religious orders, namely the Cistercians, Dominicans, and possibly the Benedictines, were erected by Greek builders following Western plans, and thus were of mixed pedigree by definition. Nevertheless, given their negligible impact on subsequent local architectural production, they were deemed inconsequential to the grand narrative of Peloponnesian architecture. In other words, by failing to become the centerpiece of a new Greek Gothic school of architecture, they were sidelined and eventually rejected as foreign to the vigorous and untainted local Byzantine artistic tradition. This obsession with stylistic purity on the part of both Western European and Greek historians tethered to competing nationalist agendas was the cause of much embarrassment and confusion with respect to the periodization of visibly mixed artworks of unknown date and provenance. Prior to the 1970s, when the Greek Byzantinist Manolis Hadzidakis convincingly attributed a number of painted panels exhibiting a combination of Italian and Byzantine traits to the workshops of Venetian Crete, Italianists tended to associate such items with pre-Renaissance painting, especially the early 14th century Maniera Greca. Conversely, Byzantinists habitually opted for a date after the great exodus of Greek painters following the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople in 1453. Mixity of form was also to blame for vagaries in geographical localization, as these panels were variously assigned to Venice on account of its perennially strong links with the East and its role as refuge for Greek immigrants fleeing the Ottomans in later centuries, or to Dalmatia, mostly due to a perceived drop in quality in comparison to true Italian works. To put it bluntly, neither the Italian nor the Greek side were willing to induct such mongrel quote unquote mongrel paintings into the pristine canon of either nation's artistic tradition, relegating them to marginal or peripheral sites of production or branding them as late and thus degenerate, just as Onla had done with architecture. Moreover, it should be noted that Hatzidakis himself considered the more Italianate of the panels in question to have, been meant, to have been meant for Latin patrons, reserving their more canonical counterparts fashioned in a pure Byzantine style for the Greeks who persevered in their religious rites and time-honored visual habits. The art historical repulsion towards stylistically mixed works of art appears to have abated in the wake of the rise of, of the field of identity studies within the social sciences during the 1950s. Sympathetic intellectual fashions encouraged a vivid interest in the art of complex multicultural societies, including those of the Latin East, fostered in 1970s Greece in particular by mounting pro-European sentiment on the eve of the country's integration within the European Economic Community in 1981. Consequently, the more local or Eastern components of works associated with the Crusaders were now coming to the fore, tempting the notion, tempering the notion of two more pure visual cultures clashing or coexisting in isolation in the same space. Viewed from this angle, Byzantinizing painting proved not to be the sole domain of the local Greeks and Eastern Christians, as the Franks seemed to also have had records to the same painters and the same mingled artistic styles. The realization of the existence of a shared artistic legacy between Western conquerors and their Eastern subjects led to fierce debates about the identity of patrons and artists, which mostly resolved, uh, revolved around stylistic or aesthetic judgments of the works themselves in the time-honored tradition of stylistic analysis, 
See, for example, the intractable controversy surrounding the Sinai Crusade icons. Going hand in hand with advances in social history, art historical scholarship eventually turned away from the age old tradition of equating style with particular cultures, nationalities and religious creeds towards a more nuanced understanding of the sharing of artistic patterns and ideas across ethno-religious boundaries on the basis of a heightened sense of class consciousness and the enactment of identity forging strategies. The gradual dissociation of the ethno-religious background of artists and patrons, for example, Frank or Latin and Greek, from the visual vocabulary they commanded and identified with, may well be the single most crucial step forward taken in the last decades in reference to the study of the art of the Latin East, the repercussions of which are only now beginning to be acknowledged to their full extent. This newfound subtlety of approach coincided with the introduction of the concept of hybridity and its companion terms, syncretism, creolization, and metissage in the context of post-colonial schools. As an analytical category, the term hybrid from the Latin hybrida, meaning bastard, originated in 19th century advances in the natural sciences, primarily botany and zoology, where it was employed to denote cross-fertilization or cross-breeding among different species or genera of plants and animals. Genetic mixing of this kind was viewed in both a negative and positive light from early on, as in some quarters, hybrid organisms were considered to be plagued by sterility, while in others, they were seen as blessed with renewed physiological vigor known as heterosis in biology. In the realm of art history, we have seen that analogous juxtapositions and mixtures of allegedly disparate visual elements in a single work were far from unknown or, un or unrecognized in the 19th and 20th centuries, in spite of the term hybrid not having been theorized and used to describe such complicated phenomena before the 1990s. In his The Location of Culture, published in 1994, the Indian-born literary theorist Homi Baba recast hybridity as the blurring of the dividing lines between two cultures that places both on equal footing. In the same collection of essays, Baba comes at the issue from a different angle by asserting that hybridity had the power to subvert colonial authority, tipping the scales in favor of the colonized. In this statement, he elaborated on the concept of intentional hybridity enunciated by Mikhail Bakhtin as a more proactive and politicized pendant to his organic hybridity, which described the natural and unobtrusive mixing, which the Russian philosopher thought to be a process innate to all cultures. Hybridity was subsequently taken up, discussed, adapted, and refined by many other authors in a plethora of different fields. For example, Marwan Crady in media studies, Peter Burke in history, or Philip Stockhammer in archeology. span to become one of the most feverishly debated concepts in modern day humanities. Baba's concept of hybridity, although controversial in its intentionality and politicized character, has left its mark on the study of the art of the Crusades. On the one hand, some scholars have adopted the core idea without naming the concept. Haralambos Buras, for instance, wrote of the appropriation of Gothic motifs in 13th century architecture in Greece as a means of satisfying an inherent need in Byzantine art for pikilia, or formal diversity. On the other hand, Heather Grossman has been far more explicit in inserting both the terms syncretism and hybrid in the title of her 2005 article on the architecture of the Frankish Morea. She argued that the mixture of local Byzantine and imported Gothic forms in both the Latin and Greek churches of 13th century Peloponnese constituted a conscious choice that resulted in the creation of a new, mixed, region-specific architectural style, which could be properly termed neither Byzantine nor Gothic. According to this view, a few short decades after the Latin conquest, this hybrid style would have appealed to both Latin and Greek patrons, since the two groups were by then integrated, at least at the upper social strata. Justine Andrews' work on architecture in Lusignan, Cyprus, and Michele Bacci's studies on religious painting in Cyprus, Venetian Crete, and other areas of the Latin East, exemplify this broader trend of conceptualizing cultural and artistic fusion as the product of a deliberate and highly problematized negotiation process, a fruitful give and take between parties on equal terms with each other. 
Such an approach has the merit of steering the field away from earlier art historical paradigms predicated, predicated on the outmoded notion of influence, flowing almost of its own volition from one artistic center, school, or tradition to another, towards the current debates about the active role of agents of transmission. The instructive example of the intensely studied murals in the churches of the Cypriot town of Famagusta attests to the novelty of the aforementioned methodology. The style of the fragmentary and precariously preserved 14th and 15th century frescoes in the Latin, Greek, Armenian, and Syrian churches of the Lusignan Kingdom's wealthiest port had been considered Italianate, most specifically Jotesque by Onlar, who not being able to resort to French models, he nevertheless identified the hands at work as those of Western European painters. This assessment notwithstanding, recent scholarship has dispelled the notion of Western authorship, suggesting instead that the murals were executed in an, in an accomplished Paleologan style by Greek artists trained at a major center of late Byzantine painting, possibly Constantinople, Thessaloniki, or Mistras. Although this evaluation of the evidence is undoubtedly correct, the disconnect that the student of Byzantine art may experience while contemplating these paintings would probably match that of a Western medievalist. This uncanny unfamiliarity stems from the concessions made by the artists to the needs and wishes of an extremely diverse clientele in terms of religious creed, language, and liturgical or ecclesiastical traditions. In most instances, pictorial programs had to be adjusted to the interior surfaces of building types unknown or seldom encountered in mainstream Byzantine architecture. The iconography had to be worked out in accordance with the precepts of the religious rite it was designed to serve, and the inscriptions needed to be formulated in the appropriate liturgical, liturgical language, that is Latin, Greek, Syriac, or Armenian. Be this as it may, in aspects of these frescoes not directly affected by doctrinal considerations or liturgical custom, detailed analysis of the transmission, reception, and adaptation of individual forms has shown that from Augustan patrons and painters, irrespective of ethno-religious background, drew upon a shared pool of iconographic and decorative motifs. They selected those forms that would seem to impart dignity and preciousness while enhancing the devotional efficaciousness of the depicted subject, regardless of their ultimate origin or the community with which they had initially been associated. To name but one example, the split cusp quatrefoils and other motifs in imitating Italian fictive intarsia ornament, which may have been introduced to Famagusta in the decoration of the Latin Cathedral of St. Nicholas, were soon thereafter taken up in the Greek Cathedral of St. George, the Syrian church now known as St. George Exorinos, and several other Latin, Greek, Latin and Greek churches throughout the island. The processes by which the selection of motifs and stylistic conventions was enacted can be studied in more detail in the better documented production of painted icons and altarpieces at the workshops of Venetian Candia, modern day Heraklion. Surviving contracts and other notarial deeds from the 15th and later centuries record collaboration agreements between Italian and Greek painters for the purpose of catering to a mixed Greco-Latin clientele. Commissions were carried out both a la Greca and a la Latina to suit all tastes. Although once again, the evidence does not bear witness to any facile correlation between the pictorial mode chosen and the right of the patron or owner. On an early 15th century Cretan polyptych, once in the church of the Abbey of Santo Stefano in Monopoli, in Apulia, the unrivaled authority enjoyed by Byzantine style painting in late medieval and early modern Europe would possibly account for the addition of such universal saints as John the Baptist and Nicholas of Myra in strongly Byzantinizing fashion, while other figures, principally those of Augustine and Stephen, made use of more Gothicizing models. In Crete itself, Andreas Regis Curiosano bearing the holy name of Jesus, a theme with clear Franciscan observant overtones, belonged by the early 17th century to the Venetocretan Cornaro family. Despite its seemingly unimpeachable credentials for Latin usage, the Greek inscription running at the bottom of the panel's front evokes the liturgy of the Sunday Matins in the Greek church, and the letter S of Christ's monogram 
and closes both the Latin and Greek versions of the iconography of resurrection, which alongside the crucifixion squeezed into the neighboring letters, concretize the redemptive role of Christ's sacrifice. Hailed as a major work of Greek painting in the will of its earliest known owner, Andrea Cornaro, the painting was cogently constructed to address both Latin and Greek viewers interested in the salvific properties of the holy name of Jesus and its iconic representation. Despite its burgeoning popularity in both the social sciences and other fields, or most probably because of it, the concept of hybridity has met with considerable skepticism from critics. Many scholars now believe the term to be too broad and all encompassing to the point that, it is use, uh, that its usefulness may be doubted since all cultures are and remain hybrid one way or another. The main criticism leveled at the use of the concept of hybridity in the study of medieval art, most recently by Bacci, hinges on the fact that by definition, the admission of the existence of hybrid art presupposes the concomitant existence of pure art an issue inherited from the 19th century scholarship, as we have seen, and enshrined in the canon of Western medieval and Byzantine art, perpetuated by our textbooks and university course modules. In this instance, the actual problem may lie not so much in the existence of the canon, as with every other academic discipline, art history needs its constants, however artificial and debatable, but I would argue in the way the canon has been formulated to exclude the art of the Latin East. The hybrid progeny of two supposedly pure artistic traditions, namely Western medieval and Byzantine, is construed as an evolutionary dead end, not unlike its sterile biological counterpart, and therefore seems to exist in a kind of limbo between the two full-fledged uh, entities destined to evolve towards early modernity and post-Byzantium. This is obviously not the case with other instances of mixed medieval art. To take but one example from Plantagenet England, Consider King Henry III's great church at Westminster Abbey. Designed in the mid 13th century by a master mason with English architectural training, it nevertheless ranks among the more international looking buildings of its time on English soil. As a coronation church and royal necropolis built for a sovereign bent on outdoing his brother-in-law, Louis IX of France in the arena of post bombastic public display, Westminster looked for inspiration to Reims Cathedral the Saint-Chapelle in Paris, and other landmark edifices associated with the French monarchy. Conversely, in its adornment with perfect marble, the adoption of a series of galleries as the elevation's middle story, the excess of surface ornament and either major features of its design, the building adhered steadfastly to an English Gothic tradition. To my knowledge, nobody has ever tried to pass off the Church of Westminster Abbey as hybrid, a, geist, a ghastly case of Honglet. Instead, it is considered to be a prime example of English medieval architecture standing at the confluence of European moors of courtly patronage. That this is not so with, say, Greek and Cypriot art of the Central and Late Middle Ages may have more to do with how modern nation building and collective pride in historic periods and their monuments developed in those countries than with the nature of the objects and monuments themselves. Another possible issue with the use of hybridity in the context of the art of the Crusades may lie in that it seems to deny the historicity of local artistic traditions. In other words, the term as it stands lacks, lacks historical depth, seeing that it prioritizes a specific moment in time, namely the moment of contact between two or more standalone artistic traditions in their admixture, yet fails to take into account the subsequent fortunes of the resultant composite forms or works. This becomes a vexing problem in the study of areas such as Crete, Cyprus, or Rhodes, where Latin rule lasted longer and the dynamic cultural dialogue between East and West crystallized into a series of more established, popular, and frequently repeated local schemes. If the late 13th century Peloponnesian church of the Dormition at Merbaca can be considered a hybrid work, combining as it does a, mi a middle Byzantine domed cross in square plan with Gothicizing detailing and spoliated ancient sculpture, then should the late 14th and 15th century church of Aios Panurios in Valsamonero also be included in this category, being a late example in a long line of Cretan churches combining Byzantinizing building types with simple Gothic ornamental motifs? 
Was the hybrid form of Balsamonero's design even legible to contemporary patrons, masons, and viewers? Or would the latter simply perceive the structure's Cretan character regardless of, or perhaps due to, its mixed gene pool? Of course, hybridization can be viewed as an ongoing process, for with the passage of time, new elements were added to the already existing mix. Tassos Papacostas has recently argued that in rural Cyprus, away from the ambitious and fashionable architecture of the urban centers, Greek ecclesiastical edifices were created in styles and techniques exhibiting remarkable continuity throughout the Middle Ages to the early modern period. The mid 16th century church of Santa of San Marina at Potamnu, for instance, wears its Cypriot Byzantine design on its sleeve, being a middle sized rubble built structure with an articulated exterior walls and diminutive openings. Nevertheless, several of its most distinguishing features refer to borrowings uh, from other traditions that impacted cultural life on the island prior to the monument's creation. The octagonal dome drum reached Cyprus from the Crusader states of Syro Palestine in the 14th century, as did the chevron moldings framing the lunette above the southern doorway. Conversely, the classicizing acanthus foliage arrayed on the hood mold crowning the aforementioned doorway made its debut packaged together with other Italian al antica motifs during the Venetian period. The new may well constitute a charming pastiche of design elements of varied provenance, having first mani manifested themselves in Cyprus at different times. Yet it's almost certainly not the crucible in which this mixed visual idiom was forged. There is in fact ample evidence to suggest that architectural hybridization was occurring over time in the multicultural and multicredal environment of the kingdom's towns long before such phenomena having become acclimatized to local aesthetic and building traditions, started seeping into the countryside. In the same vein as Crete and Valsamonero, it would probably be hard to historically justify calling buildings like Potamnu with their second-hand hybridity anything other than simply Cypriot, um, despite their blatantly mixed aspect. From the foregoing discussion, it should have become evident that the concept of hybridity proved somewhat inadequate in encompassing the full complexity of the cultural phenomena with which we're dealing here, given that the ideal theoretical armature to be applied in the study of artistic encounters in the Latin East should acknowledge not only the creation of new composite stylistic idioms, but also its subsequent development and enrichment with new ingredients from the same or different sources. The ongoing quest for the formulation of opposite analytical terms to describe and define the coming together of cultures in the social hotbed of the late medieval and early modern Eastern Mediterranean has led to experimentation with yet another term currently in vogue among social scientists, the proponents of which present as a viable alternative to hybridity. The Cuban anthropologist Fernando Ortiz has been credited with airing the concept of transculturation in 1940, when he wrote about the social, cultural and racial dynamics at work in his country through the lens of how they were shaped by its supply of the global market with tobacco and sugar. In this early incar incarnation, <clears throat> excuse me, the term was still largely informed by the post-colonial Latin American discourse on mestizaje, which concerned the active two-way sociocultural blending of people of European, African, and indigenous descent to forge a single composite national identity out of components assigned equal value. As such, it was naturally and closely related to its kindred concept, hybridity, with which it is often discussed, compared, and contrasted. Transculturation in its Ortician definition and subsequent elaborations by authors such as the Uruguayan literary critic Angel Rama has had lasting currency in Latin American studies. Yet the concept as applied to recent medievalist research is clearly more indebted to the ground upper definition affected by the contemporary German philosopher Wolfgang Welsh. By his own admission, Welsh was unaware of the pertinent theoretical developments on the other side of the Atlantic when he began publishing on transculturality in the early 1990s. His model for diachronic human rapport, which in its exclusive preoccupation with culture, circumvented the thorny racial questions baked in much of modern and contemporary cultural theory, hammered in another nail in the coffin of the national purity and homogeneity of cultures. 
According to Welsh national identity, the end product of 19th century nation building campaigns and cultural identity should be distinguished in recognition of the fact that the two do not necessarily correspond outside the state rhetoric of national unity. The point is made even more explicit in his dismissal of theories based on the concepts of multiculturality and interculturality, both of which posit cultures as unyielding monolithic constructs that can be juxtaposed and run together without truly becoming compromised in their unitary essentialist nature. For Welsh, all cultures are mixed by definition and they become ever, ever more mixed as time wears on, although they do not or will not result in an undifferentiated globalized blend for admixture does not occur in automatic or deterministic fashion, but through the ad hoc selection and the reinterpretation of individual elements. Ultimately, transculturality as opposed to transculturation would appear to be turning away from the tension, disjunction and friction between cultures that haunt post-colonial identity politics towards a more positive pluralistic model, stressing human communication and understanding across the tatters of made up boundaries. It did not take long for art historians to realize the pregnant potential of Welsh's definition of transculturality for their own discipline. German in particular has raised the concept across a cornucopia of research networks and programs, conferences and publications spanning all historical periods from antiquity to the present. And I particularly like the uh, um, cover that you see uh, up on the right about transcultural art therapy. Uh, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, Western medievalists such as Margit Mersch and Ulrike Ritzerfeld have availed themselves of the possibilities furnished by this scholarly impetus to frame sociocultural interaction in medieval and early modern Cretan Cyprus. Cretan panel painting of the 15th and 16th centuries is now viewed as a transcultural concoction, blending both Italianate and Paleologan elements, which could be inflected on demand either a la Greca or a la Latina to respond to different tastes or visual functions. Such an interpretation would imply that as time passed, the two contributing stylistic modes shed most of their extra textual associations with the ethno-religious and cultural collectivities amidst which they were developed to congeal into a visual language that would presumably be considered Cretan by the island's inhabitants and foreign by most everybody else. Similar allegations have recently been made regarding monumental church architecture in Cyprus, although without evoking the theoretical concepts involved. The medieval Greek metropolitan churches of the Lusignan Kingdom's two main urban enclaves, Nicosia and Famagusta, have always fascinated and puzzled scholars, as their patrons and builders seemingly rejected the long tradition of local Byzantine architecture to adopt the Gothic style, seen at its most uh, majestic in the same town's Latin cathedrals. The combination of aisled plans, revolted interiors and profuse sculptural and painted ornament with prominent domes over the central vessel made these edifices the figureheads of the so-called Franco-Byzantine group, a small assemblage of highly ambitious buildings designed at the juncture of Gothic and Byzantine architectural traditions. The remarkable ambition of these splendid hybrids unmatched in scale and panache in the Eastern Mediterranean at this time, and the conspicuous neutralization of the colonial undertones um, of the Gothic Isle plan by its crowning with the Byzantine dome, were extolled by nationalist-minded scholars as attestations of the improving fortunes of the Greek ecclesiastical hierarchy and their principal supporters, the Greek merchant class from the 14th century onwards. More recent research has challenged the credentials of the Franco-Byzantine as an homogeneous typological category, even going as far as stating that the dome atop the clear story of the mid 14th century Basilica of St. George of the Greeks in Famagusta was not part of the original design, having been added during a late 15th century reconstruction by reference to Venetian Renaissance models. In this view, the Greek community of Famagusta and the cathedral clergy would have patterned the building after the Latin cathedral of St. Nicholas, taking over its form to celebrate a newfound confidence and wealth by means of the most prestigious kind of architecture money could buy. Even though the exact date of the Dome of St. George is still being disputed, there can, uh, there can be little doubt that such features would have visually alluded to the Greek church, seeing as domes did not grace the churches of any other religious rite on the island. 
Moreover, the incongruous incorporation of parts of earlier building phases of both Famagusta and Nicosia, dating back to the Middle Byzantine period in the former case and to early Christian times in the latter, would argue in favor of a staunch promotion of institutional history by the Greek bishoprics. This unambiguous material evocation of the past was very likely calibrated to highlight the Greek prelate's centuries-long presence in Cypriot urban life, which had been challenged in the previous century by the Latin church, most decisively by the stipulation in Alexander IV's Bula Cypria that the official seats of the Greek seas be removed to the countryside, away from the towns where their Latin counterparts resided. In some Cypriot Greek cathedral architecture made use of established high urban styles appropriate to the, state, to the status of the institutions that the buildings were meant to represent, and at the same time, inflected to project a resolutely Greek identity. Consequently, in a manner analogous to that of Cretan painting, by the 14th century, Cypriot Gothic had divested itself of any ethno-religious connotations it might have had in the past to accommodate a broader spectrum of the kingdom's high society, who molded this flexible visual language to conform to their individual aspirations and needs. Needless to say, such transcultural architectural phenomena were in no way unique to Cyprus. Across the sea from the small island kingdom, the Armenian Cathedral of St. James in Jerusalem, built in the mid 12th century, possibly under orders from Queen Melisande, was designed and executed by masons trained in the distinctive Romanesque style prevalent in the Holy City in this period, and which informed contemporary edifices for the Latin and other rites. Looking beyond the confines of the Latin East in urban centers all over Europe, medieval Jewish synagogues were habitually conceived in terms of the prevailing local architectural styles, Romanesque and Gothic in Central Europe, or Mudéjar in the Iberian Peninsula, which were also applied to the construction of churches and mosques. The same was true of the architecture of Protestant temples erected for reformed worship in the 16th and 17th centuries, and which were designed either in the Gothic or the fashionable Italian classicizing style of the modern period, just like contemporary Catholic churches. What all these instances of non-Latin, non-Catholic, and even non-Christian architecture have in common is their reliance on the mainstream local visual idioms available to all city and town dwellers to articulate identities and ritual functions exclusive to the communities meant to use them. Both synagogues and Protestant places of worship followed a rather fluid architectural typology, dependent above all on the size and shape of the building plot, the restrictions imposed by the governing political and ecclesiastical authorities, and the proximity and tolerance of non-Jewish or non-Protestant populations. However, what the builders of such structures had to avoid at all costs was evoking the cruciform plan and outward appearance of the Christian or Catholic church. The case of late 16th century France is especially instructive in this regard, as the Edict of Nantes, 1598, which granted Protestants liberty of conscience and freedom of worship for a time, explicitly and strictly proscribed any visual similarity between newly built reformed and Catholic places of worship. Architectural historians have proposed to see in this stricture the banning in Protestant contexts of the erection of towers and belfries, perhaps even the provision for flying buttresses, elements that had become integral to the collective image of the Catholic church edifice. Apart from what medieval Jews and early modern Protestants were not allowed to do, of course, one should also consider how they chose to adjust the formal repertoire of contemporary architectural design to suit their own needs. Jewish worship in the quasi-secular congregational space of the synagogue was by a focal, pivoting around the Torah Ark, Aron HaKodesh, and the preaching platform, Bima, and thus lacked the unidirectional focus of the Christian church towards the sanctuary and the high altar. Protestant temples often adopted centralized plans, which made the pulpit at the center of the building, whence the word of God was preached to the congregation, the primary focus of religious activity. Such quintessential foci of cultic attention in the interior of both synagogues and reformed temples were often enhanced through their suggestive framing by microarchitectural ornaments, normally reserved for the paraphernalia of Christian or Catholic worship. The proliferation of miniaturized Gothic architectural elements across all artistic media in mid 13th century France 
predicated on the institutionalization of architectural draftsmanship, kickstarted the fashion all across Europe for enveloping imagery in extremely fine and precious frames inspired by full-scale Gothic grandeur. Such ornament is often thought to have evoked the ethereal cityscape of the heavenly Jerusalem, or to have simply served as a marker of sacredness designed to trigger a devotional response. The liberal sprinkling of microarchitecture on sculpture, stained glass, liturgical vessels, tombs, and other categories of objects, both quote unquote sacred and profane, meant that whatever meaning such forms might have been invested with, it applied only in the broadest possible sense. Coming once again back to Cyprus, Gothic microarchitecture graced first and foremost the canopies crowning the statues of saints on the facades of the Latin cathedrals of Nicosia and Famagusta, as well as the altar tabernacles, piscinas, assorted church furnishings, and funerary monuments to be found in ecclesiastical edifices of the Latin Rite. In a process of creative translocation and adaptation that should be familiar to us by now, microarchitecture soon entered the churches of the other Christian rites, assuming functions analogous to the ones it had in its original context. In Famagusta's Armenian church, for instance, the niche housing the table of gifts for the celebration of mass at the altar is adorned with a cusped arch redolent of the format of the side apse piscinas in the Latin cathedral. In St. George of the Greeks, microarchitecture is introduced in a similarly Eucharistic context. The low and narrow flat roof chambers accommodated in the thickness of the wall directly to the north of and communicating with each of the church's three apses were the site where the prothesis rite was performed. Their east end is in the form of a scaled down sanctuary with an ashlar built table wedged at the foot of a narrow apse lighted by a single lancet window and crowned by a microarchitectural rib vaulted semi-dome. This highly unusual arrangement may well be indicative of the tenacity of Greek liturgical traditions. In the Byzantine world, the prothesis rite by which, the, uh, by which the gifts or elements of the mass, the bread and the wine, were prepared for the celebration at the altar and the space in which it was performed were symbolically linked with the sanctuary and its Eucharistic functions. Medieval authors often took the prothesis to stand for Bethlehem, the site of Christ's birth, which was bound to the altar representing Jerusalem and Christ's tomb by the teleology of Christian sacred history. Although the Latin church frowned upon and decreed against the veneration accorded by the Greeks and Syrian Melkites to the gifts of the prophecies prior to their consecration at the altar and thus their transubstantiation into the body and blood of Christ, the exceptional emphasis on the Gothic microarchitectural rendition of the spaces in which this ritual act took place underscored the latter's long-held uh, long sacramental associations in the eyes of the Greek clergy. These last thoughts adumbrate how much insight may be gained into the history of art and architecture in the Latin East by casting a comparative eye, opening up the field to a broader consideration of parallel or analogous transcultural developments elsewhere. Such a bold panoramic vision is obviously now being encouraged by the reluctant yet progressive post-colonization of what has hitherto been considered the hard core of the Western Middle Ages, barricaded behind a monolithic Latin Christian identity the coherence of which appears increasingly dubious. France and the German lands, for example, are joining the Iberian Peninsula and Sicily at the supposed periphery of Europe in becoming loci of fragmented multifocal narratives. These developments are taking place at a time when the global turn in the humanities and social sciences has given rise to alternative histories variously described as global, connected, entangled, intersecting, or transnational, aiming at dissolving what is left of the old national blinders to a holistic, comprehensive picture of art production in any given period. Concurrently, the meeting and mixing of cultural traditions on this expanded plane of inquiry is now being signaled by terms such as transfers, entanglements, or circulations, which are engineered to level the playing field by deliberately avoiding to privilege any one culture in its relationship with any of its counterparts. From the vantage point of the present, it appears as if we are hurtling towards a dissented and destabilized medieval world, 
the only constant of which is likely to be a fertile fragmentation leading in due course to the formation of new paradigms of cultural and artistic constellations unfettered by the shackles of nationalist doctrine. In this brave new world, the artistic output of the Latin West and Latin East may be fruitfully compared, correlated, contrasted, and otherwise jointly considered without the specter of 19th and 20th century conceptions of cultural hegemony and resistance looming over the proceedings. Most, if not all of us, will agree that these are all very intriguing prospects. However, as someone who has been brought up on a wholesome diet of good old fashioned art historical formalism with a healthy side of empiricism, I sometimes wonder whether in our reliance on contemporary social theory to articulate the wider cultural dynamics, which engendered the art of the late Middle ages and early modernity, we do not lose track of the objects themselves. What is needed here, I believe, is a conceptual framework that would eschew colonialist and nationalist bias while remaining attuned to the particular historical circumstances of art production and consumption in pre-modern and early modern societies. Before I conclude this talk, let me turn briefly to the concept of eclecticism, which has recently been given pride of place in the title of International Symposium on the Art, History and Culture of Late Medieval Eastern Europe, convened at Princeton University by Maria Alessia Rossi and Alice Isabella Sullivan. In its first documented appearance in the lives of the eminent philosophers by the third, uh, by the third century Greek thinker, Diogenes Laertius, it denoted a philosophical school whose adherents felt free to pick and choose uh, their beliefs and opinions from the rich intellectual buffet offered by their colleagues in other, often rival sects. The concept was subsequently elaborated on by Denis Diderot in his mid 18th century encyclopedie, where it is stated that, quote, the eclectic is a philosopher who dares to think on his own, end quote. Around the same time, the term was introduced to the nascent field of art history, most conspicuously by Winkelmann, who praised the ability of the Baroque painters Agostino and Annibale Caracci to creatively fuse in their works elements and ideas drawn from antiquity Raphael, Michelangelo, Venetian, and Lombard masters. However, this positive view of eclectic artistic production as the felicitous outcome of a process of selection and combination of acclaimed earlier sources, rooted in medieval and early modern workshop practice and sustained by the training dispensed at the academies, was soon to be superseded by a radically different ideal. Gaining steam since the 16th century and emerging as a fully formed doctrine in the 18th, the cult of artistic genius, prized originality and distinctiveness, uh, distinctiveness of authorial voice above the pre-production of esteemed models, thus precipitating the denigration of eclecticism in the arts as an uninspired rehash of worn out ideas. Even though the term continued to be applied to historicist architectural and artistic endeavors in the 19th and 20th centuries, its latter day negative connotations prevented it from being theorized into a mainstay in critical art historiography. Be that as it may, in the aftermath of Roland Barthes' uh, Death of the Author, 1967, eclecticism is now experiencing a resurgence likely to consolidate it as a key creative concept in the artistic practice of modernity on a global scale. With its roots in philosophy, its resonance with the circumstances of art production and consumption in pre-modern and modern societies, and its emphasis on the calculated selection of elements from varied sources in the creation of a new work, eclecticism may furnish a framework for the study of medieval and early modern art, at least as responsive to the present scholarly debate as some of the terms currently in use. As the dust has far from settled in the arena of competing conceptualization proposals vying for supremacy, I am sure we can afford to give it a fighting chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michali, uh, for this rich, informed and fascinating uh, presentation, but also for this formidable review uh, of uh, theoretical uh, approaches to the art and architecture of uh, the Latin East. I, I certainly agree that um, it is a complex, a rather complex uh, subject and, uh, and our approach to uh, stylistic another. Uh, accommodations or adaptations or other 
the shared artistic vocabulary uh, of, uh, of the period certainly needs constant uh, evaluation and revising. And having said that, I'm sure that there will be a, a discussion, uh, a, a thorough discussion afterwards uh, during our uh, Q&A session, which can start right away. Um, uh, so please uh, uh, raise your hand or you, you can also type your question on the, um, uh, on the chat, uh, on our chat function uh, on Zoom uh, and I can read it out. So Michalis, or you can raise your hand and unmute your microphone uh, should you wish to address your, um, uh, your question or comment directly to, to Michalis Olympios. Um, Okay, let me check, Michael. Please bear with me. I'll just go sure. through quickly uh, to see if there is uh, already any comments or questions on our chat. Uh, not yet, apart from uh, uh, many congratulating messages and wishes for your presentation tonight. Um, yes, uh, we, we already have uh, a question uh, or comment from Dionysis Tathakopoulos. Uh, yes, Dionysis. Thank you very much, Michaeli, for this uh, very powerful tour d'horizon. And uh, the, the, the question I have um, is not so much art historical, I would say, but um, has perhaps implications. Um, how political do you see um, this turn? I mean, I think you touched on that. Um, you know, the, on the one hand, you know, the nationalist sort of, you know, putting things in very separate boxes and not wishing for things to be mingled in any case. And now, of course, our uh, trend or, 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 you know, efforts to do perhaps the exact opposite. So how would you see your work um, in, in that kind of, you know, politicized, if you'd like, um, context? Mm. That's a very good question. And a, a question that I had anticipated, actually, because um, obviously, you know, once you talk about all this, um, the first question that pops to mind is, what is your view about, you know, what's going on? And um, I mean, I guess I did talk a little bit about that uh, during uh, the presentation, um, you know, siding with the criticism sometimes of uh, other scholars. Um, but um, I feel that you know, words like hybridity, transculturality, and so on, uh, have too much baggage. And it would be difficult for me to use them, let's say, you know, um, uh, you know in, in, in my own work. Um, but um, I tend to sort of skirt around, I tend to, I, I, I tend to cheat a little bit mm. uh, in, in this way, because I, I, I sort of choose, I mean, most of the time, uh, I sort of choose to work on uh, things that uh, do not necessarily pertain to um, the mixing of cultures so much. But of course, it's impossible to avoid it uh, entirely. And um, I, I guess I am a product of my time as well. So, you know, of this very uh, sort of global um, look at things and, um, you know, having, st having studied at the Courtauld as well, which sort of promotes this international approach you know, uh, I guess I sort of fit in, uh, in that field. Um, but I have to admit that I try to avoid using any of these terms uh, because then I would have to explain them and explain what exactly I mean by using them because um, they have become very elastic nowadays. I try to sort of sort out what hybridity might mean right now. But the thing is, it's, there's just so much on it. Um, so many scholars have tried to adjust because the fact that these um, terms exist and are being used um, has prompted scholars to sort of try and make do with them, try to fit them to their own uh, research or their own views and so on. Uh, and so um, if you're going to be using them, you'll have to explain them. You have to you know, have a little excursus on whatever hybridity means to you, I suppose. Um, and so uh, it's tricky, I have to say. Uh, and you know, 10 years after my first encounter with hybridity, 
I can say that I would be more circumspect, circumspect in using it nowadays than um, I did back in the day. Thank you. I hope I have replied to your question. Great. Uh, thank you, Dionysi. There is a question from Yorgos Kazamias, and then we can move on to Heather Grossman. Yes, Yorgos. Oh, no, it is. Uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Sorry, there was some uh, mixing up. Uh, many thanks, Michaelis, for this uh, wonderful lecture and uh, very enlightening for me. Um, just a question, and maybe it's only my ignorance, but does this uh, term uh, hybridity maybe it um, tends to cover, to hide uh, the tensions between styles, cultural uh, concepts, uh, uh, mentalities, and uh, to paint? Uh, maybe a too rosy picture of uh, cultural past. The same applies also for cultural, uh, cultural transfer, which is very, very, very popular among intellectual historians. Maybe this too, too rosy. So, sorry, I don't think so. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, thank you. It's, it's, it's a very good question actually, because um, there's always the danger of uh, slipping too far uh, to the other side, in a sense. And um, it's true. I mean, there's, um, there's a tendency to gloss over any, uh, you know, any, any sort of uh, clashes uh, that might have existed. The thing is, um, obviously, these are umbrella terms. So um, everything has to be examined on a case by case basis, when, especially when we do have uh, evidence, like uh, written evidence, or you know, not, you know, stuff, um, you know, concrete evidence be besides um, style. That's what I mean. Um, and then maybe, just maybe, you can extrapolate something more useful from well-documented cases to apply to the ones that are not uh, as well-documented. Uh, but there always, there's always the danger, and um, uh, that's why I had that caveat at the beginning of the talk where I said um, that. Uh, Obviously, this is going to be highly selective, you know, very broad. And uh, uh, there were several things I didn't touch on uh, in my talk, I have to admit. Uh, and, um, you know, these are just, I guess, general trends. But even having said that, um, there are several things I didn't talk about. Like, for example, Giuseppe Gerola is a, is a good example of an early um, researcher who, um, also began uh, working on Crete, on uh, the architecture and the art of Crete in the Venetian period, uh, prompted by, well, prompted, he was, he was hired to work in Crete by the Instituto of Veneto di Scienze Lettere et Arti. So his, his mission was to, um, to, to show uh, the, uh, the power and prestige of the Stato da Mar, basically, to sort of extol Venice as this grand maritime power. But when he went to Crete and looked at those monuments, he realized that he couldn't really um, just work on Venice because everything was so mixed. So, you know, he had to work on the Byzantine stuff as well and the Ottoman stuff. Uh, so uh, he had to have this very broad view of, of things. And uh, he's much more... Um, let's say, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's less, he's more mellow than Camilo Onla, for example, in his, uh, in his way of uh, presenting the material. Uh, and then, um, you know, there, there, there's nuances, there are several nuances that I haven't really um, touched on here. So yes, there's always the danger of over, you know, uh, of, of the pendulum going all the way to one side. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, Heather Grossman. Uh, hi, Michaelis. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really very fascinating and interesting. And, and thank you for the, the shout out, I guess I should say, um, to my work. But I would say that like you, um, now 15 years on from the 2005 article, um, I would uh, now wish that I could republish the, the title of that piece to not include um, hybridity either. <laughs> this is a word that I have um, well moved away from myself, um, as well as syncretism because of the many problems that you've cited, 
um, and some others, um, including, I think, um, in, in relationship to the previous question, um, maybe not only the, in some cases, too rosy reading of hybridity, but also the, the baggage of um, its extreme negative connotations that are also associated with that term. It's a very problematic one for us to use. Um, so I really um, uh, am very much uh, in agreement with everything you've said, and um, in particular, the, the need for us to come up with uh, another framework or conceptualization that um, uh, maybe owes more to art history than to some of the social sciences. And I got to say, I'm working on it. I actually have a new conceptualization, and I'll be publishing that next year in a book that I'm putting out. Um, really looking forward to that then. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to seeing what, how people react to it, and um, we'll see. So if I could move to a, a question now, um, instead of the, the commentary. Um, I um, really applaud the, the kind of deep dive that you did, um, taking us through the history of these terms and reading of different forms. Um, but one thing I was wondering about, um, because I think we don't, um, as a group of people who work on these kinds of mixed transcultural forms, I think we often um, focus on patronage and particularly the kind of um, cultural identity of the patrons of these groups. So can you say a little bit more about what you think the contributions of the artists, artisans, sculptors, masons, et cetera, are who also contribute to this mixing, um, particularly to the notions of fluidity? We know that in the past, people like Anlar would say that, you know, these masons, the reason why these buildings can't really be considered to be Gothic buildings are because the Greek masons are so poor, they don't know what they're doing. Um, but I think that um, a different way to look at that is to look at how, um, the workers who created these things are injecting their own um, modes of understanding of production uh, into the creation of these works. And that it's very much a part of how we get to the, the, to the fluidity and the mixing um, of these different works. Well, thank you. That's, uh, that's a wonderful question, I have to say. And um, the thing is, I, I've been trying to look at this <clears throat> from a sort of a European perspective. And uh, um, as you well know, uh, you do have cases where even in Western Europe, like in Naples, for example, you know, in the Kingdom of Naples, um, there's this uh, uh, interesting series of studies by Caroline Brazelius on um, uh, you know, the, uh, the Cistercian abbeys that were built in uh, Angevin, Naples. And those were um, apparently built by local masons again. And in that case, I think we have uh, textual evidence as well. Um, and, uh, but the, the sculptors are apparently Western, uh, I mean, Western Europeans who were apparently called in to sort of work uh, on the more uh, flashy pieces of sculpture. And uh, uh, so there's, um, there's definitely a contribution by the locals there as well. Um, and uh, there seems to be um, a similar kind of approach in other areas, um, especially when dealing with um, religious orders, for, for example, the Cistercians or the Dominicans, the Franciscans and so on, because the plans of the building seem to be um, sort of transnational, let's put it that way, you know, um, they seem to be traveling distances from Italy to other parts of Europe. Um, uh, it's usually Italy to the north and then to the, also to the Mediterranean, uh, but the, um, uh, the, uh, the main d'oeuvre is usually, again, local even in Germany, even in France. So it's, it's, a, it's a more, um, uh, it's, it's a wider phenomenon. It's not just the Latin East. And I guess that's my, uh, my point in some ways is that the Latin East doesn't really differ from what's going on in other places in Europe uh, in terms of how these relationships were managed. Um, it's just, in our case, maybe it's more visible in the sense that the styles are more different sometimes. And also there's the baggage of connecting those styles with particular uh, cultural spheres and so on. Whereas, you know, in the West that doesn't really apply except in, you know, explicitly nationalist terms, you know, uh, if you're English and, you know, this Frenchman come in and work on your monuments and you don't like it. Uh, but um, I guess that's, uh, that's in a way the, the way, you know, the, the sort of, argument, I guess, I would make in my own work um, uh, that, you know, it's, it's not really all that different from what goes on mm -hmm. elsewhere. Um, and not even, you know, France, Germany, you know, like the big 
players in uh, Western medieval Europe, which you know are, are usually considered to be sort of um, unified and monolithic and so on. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and definitely, I mean, with the Cistercians, you see that quite a bit. And uh, there's a, this whole theory that they, um, you know, they, they carried the Gothic style with them wherever they went and so on. And this has been challenged too now. So who knows where we stand right now? <laughs> I think you bring up an interesting point, though, if I could just follow that. Um, the thing to do is, again, you need to look at it by the the people who are using and building these things. So we are talking about instead of national um, groupings or even ethnic groupings, you're talking about orders or you're talking about um, religious groups or these kinds of things, very particular ones. And so you're looking at it between the organization and the networks of a particular religious order we're also, um, as I saw in the Peloponnese, looking at it in terms of the religious order plus the region from which the, um, the monks might have been sent because there's other than religious and secular relationships that get involved. So it's a really good way to look at it. Yeah, what I haven't done, and I'm not sure I will ever do, to be honest, not because I wouldn't want to, it's just that I'm not really, um, I guess, qualified to do that, is to look at you know what's going on in non-Christian um, areas, you know, around the Mediterranean, like, you know, in uh, Islamic states and so on, you know, I I are there any similar phenomena? I guess I could look at it in a very superficial way, but I'm not an Islamicist, so it would be um, sort of treading on somebody else's toes, I suppose. But that's something that needs to be done, I guess. Uh, it's being done. It's being done by our colleagues in, in the Islamic oh, wonderful. Schools, so okay. it's Good. happening. Thank you. Thank you again. Excellent. Thank you, Heather. Um, uh, are there any other questions? I would also like to ask you to uh, switch on your cameras, if you wish, uh, so there is a more interaction between all of us and our speaker. Um, Mikhaili, there is still, of course, congratulating messages coming in. I, I personally very much, oh, sorry, Maria Barani. <laughs> Maria first, please. Uh, yes. Hello. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Mihaly, for this, you know, thought-provoking, excellent lecture. Uh, um, uh, building uh, on what Heather asked about the social context where these exchanges took place, it, it sounded to me as if it was more kind of a, in some cases, at least in Cyprus, it was more kind of a an urban phenomenon to begin with, the, and we are dealing with the upper strata of urban society. And then once it becomes naturalized, then it, it becomes as part of, or it, it becomes part of a local tradition. And then we see it, uh, have, have I, did I understand correctly? Is this yeah, what yeah. is happening? Yeah, that's pretty much it, yeah. Okay, so, uh, but in a, a, is this something that happens in Cyprus uh, because of, of, because the cities were more, uh, were more mixed in a sense? Or do you see this, um, this, this model as uh, applying elsewhere as well? Um, because maybe uh, I, I don't know because the, the 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 orders that you mentioned were were they actually located in the cities or how, so, how did some, it work? some of them okay yeah. okay. Uh, okay I mean the mendicant orders are usually uh, established either in the cities themselves or in the close periphery um, uh, and um, you know um, the Cistercians for example uh, um, Again, usually thought to uh, be established in the countryside, although that's not a hundred percent certain because um, you also have the uh, male-female divide. Female monasteries are much more prone to actually be, uh, situ be situated in the cities near urban centers for um, uh, reasons of security. So uh, there's also that. And uh, they're also close to male monasteries because they need to be supervised by, um, by monks. So, um, and the Cistercians are not, I mean, we, we used to think that the Cistercians were out in the countryside, uh, you know, in their own little sort of um, uh, European desert, 
but um, the truth is that they were actually closely located closely to the towns and you know this um, rhetoric of being out in the wild by themselves is more of a, a rhetorical trope in the end in, in the writings. Um, so um, in, in Cyprus it seems as if you get the um, the mixture let's say in the cities th themselves and then that trickles trickles down and outwards in a way uh, into the countryside, even though sometimes we do get um, buildings that are uh, Greek, Greek right. Uh, they are Byzantinizing in type. They are dome hall churches, for example, uh, but they were built by Latin patrons. So, and that's, that's not just Cyprus, of course, you get that in the Peloponnese, you get that in Crete. It's a wider phenomenon. So the, the cities seem like uh, seem to be this um, great cauldron in a way where uh, things are being mixed and then taken out. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if this is too reductive. It might be, um, but um, that's my working theory for now, anyway. Uh, and uh, you know, until proven wrong, or you know, I, I think otherwise, anyway. Um, and but it, it's not just Cyprus, though. I mean, I don't think it's a, an exclusively Cypriot phenomenon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Maria. Yes, I, I was actually about to comment on this. My my comments last question was similar to Maria's. I was wondering. I mean, Cyprus is so characteristic. Is it's uh, the, the, this kind of uh, architecture, this kind of you know blending of uh, architectural elements from both local, both local and Western Latin uh, are so common. And I I'm intrigued, although I'm not a specialist on, on this issue, obviously. I'm always intrigued. I, actually, I, I visited for the first time the, the church of Agia Marina Potam New yesterday. And I was amazed by the, uh, you know, this, all these architectural elements that blend together so nicely and yet makes you wonder why. I mean, there are cases, obviously, like Agia Marina, uh, elsewhere in Cyprus, in the countryside, that is outside the urban centers. And they're so common, especially from in the 16th and 17th centuries. And in cases where you don't have the, we don't know the identity of the patrons, uh, whether the religious or ethnic identity, how do you, I mean, it makes you wonder, how do you approach these buildings? But I'm new is, is, is not an easy place to get. Uh, I had difficulty in finding it. The road is not good. And I, it still gives you the sense of isolation, you know, of marginality. So finding this elaborate church in the middle of the village, of the present day village was amazing. So, I mean, it, it, I, I'm not expecting an answer, obviously. I know it's difficult to answer, to tackle such a um, question or comment, but uh, what do you think? I mean, in, what, terms, what, of, in, in terms of the spread of, of of these architectural elements into the countryside uh, in the 16th century or even earlier? Yeah, um, I, I thought, that is the question whether we can tell if it's Greek or Latin uh, without the help of sources, because I think you did mention that. And uh, the answer is um, sometimes, <laughs> let's put it that way because um, style by itself doesn't really help uh, at all. If you, if you don't have, you know, like um, uh, other evidence, coats of arms, inscriptions, you know, uh, written sources, something, um, then I guess your only chance, besides typology, and typology can be treacherous sometimes. I mean, it doesn't mean that if you get a Byzantine looking church, uh, it's def definitely meant for the, uh, for the Greek rite. Mm -hmm. And I have to also um, remind myself sometimes that we don't really know what a Maronite church looks like. Uh, I mean, not, uh, cert uh, not we're not certain anyway. So, um, you know, uh, they had their own churches and we don't know if any of the uh, buildings survive. Uh, maybe one in Famagusta, but, uh, you know, it's, it's an open question. So um, there's also that factor which might be problematic, but, um, the other thing I guess you can look at is not style itself, but um, uh, functional apparatus, whether you have piscinas, and then you can more safely say that this is a Latin building, 
or prophecies, you know, things like that that might uh, clue you into the the use of, of the partic that particular building. Um, but if the building is in ruins and you can't see that, well, you know, it's 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 hard. <laughs> what can I say? Um, and uh, uh, in terms of the spread outside the um, the cities, uh, there are cases where. Uh, as I was telling Maria, uh, you have churches like Lissos, which I think I showed uh, in the slides. That one seems to be Greek, Greek rite anyway. Um, it, it, it's, its architectural type is you know, Byzantinizing, it's a dome hall church, mm -hmm. but um, it has a set of coat of arms uh, that are immured into the wall. And uh, uh, the, uh, at least one of these can be identified as a family of knights um, that were stationed, some of them were stationed in Nicosia, like most of the, uh, most of the nobility in, in this period, but um, some of them were in Polychrysochus, so not too far away from uh, Lissos. And um, one wonders whether that particular church was built by them for the use of, you know, the Greek inhabitants of the fief or whatever. Uh, it's just that we don't really know for certain if they possessed the fief in this particular period. I mean, the historical information is lacking, um, but it's a possibility. Uh, and there are other cases like this, you know, churches with coats of arms that might have been built um, by Latin patrons for Greek, uh, you know, Greek users, to put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get, you know, the, the opposite in towns where you, you have... Uh, uh, Gothic buildings erected by Greek users, uh, but uh, and in some cases um, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, in others, it's more difficult to say what's going on because um, you know the, the case of Saint George of the Greeks, uh, which is a Greek church, no doubt about that, but it has the arms of the king spread throughout it, and the um, you know Saint Peter and Paul as well, which is an, an Astorian church apparently, uh, so a Syrian church. But again, you have the arms of the king and possibly his brother as well uh, on the keystones. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you very much, Michali. I think Heather wanted to add something to this, right? Yeah, I was just going to say it's really. I think I think to go back to Mikhail's point that we have to sort of um, stop thinking about the the purity of those categories is super important because um, there are other examples from the Peloponnese, for example, which is the place that I know the best. That um, first we have. I mean, we can also go back to the writings of Nikita Soniatis, who tells us, and other um, also um, documentation we have where there are um, bishops in Constantinople writing to priests in the Peloponnese and other places saying, um, you all need to stop practicing the right like those Latin people. Like, so even within the, the, the Greek um, Orthodox community, they're starting to um, take on characteristics in terms of the ritual and the ways that the Latins were doing it um, within their you know, immediate surroundings. Um, so, as architectural historians, we want to read these things as being one thing or the other thing, but the people who are using them are doing completely things that don't fit these categories at all. Mm -hmm. And another example of this from the Peloponnese is um, the church at Gastuni, the Panagia church at Gastuni is, you know, by all intents and purposes, when you look at it, it is a middle Byzantine church, a domed cross and square, um, does have Gothic sculptural elements on it, but, um, you know, um, Dimitris Athanasoulis uh, found a few years ago an inscription in the building from uh, 1276 that names four brothers who have um, Latin first names, a Greek last name, and they say that they basically have made the church as a Latin rite church. Um, so it's, it's all very, very mixed up um, in terms of these categorizations and these forms. I think yeah. that there's a church in, um, well, Blaherne, um, that um, actually has a piscina in it, yeah. I think. So, you know, it's, it's a, again, it's a dome, a dome crossing square church with a piscina and, you know, it might have belonged to the Cistercians, you know, right. there's all sorts of theories there. The book uh, is even weirder because it can be read as a, as a three-aisled hall church or as a centrally planned church. It's a very strange building. <laughs> yeah. And I, to add to this, uh, thank you so much. Uh, to, to add to this, um, I mean, the, uh, the Bedestan project, the um, Panagia of the Yitria project that we um, worked on, uh, you know, in the, in, the in, in the last few years, um, 
has brought to the fore more evidence about what was actually in the building in, in the Odigitria, because they, uh, they apparently found, uh, the, you know, the, the, the Brits who undertook the excavations there in um, the 1930s and 40s, apparently found uh, several fragments of uh, sculpture, of statues in the round in the church. Uh, and they described them as uh, statues of saints. Uh, the problem is none of them appear to have come down to us. I haven't found any photographs, uh, a, few a few descriptions, but, um, you know, they're sort of vague. So it's hard to, so, you know, like put your finger on what exactly they're describing. But, you know, it was P Peter McGaw, so I'm sure he knew what he was saying. Um, and uh, so, you know, you've got sculpture in a, in, in, in a um, Gothic style Orthodox building. So, you know, that should give us pause, I think, <laughs> about several things. And uh, even though you have all these uh, travelers in the travelogue saying that the Greeks only use painted images uh, and not, um, you know, uh, graven images, idols or whatever. Uh, so, um, but apparently, you know, these are the exceptions. Um, you know, a church like the Odigitria or St. George of the Greeks, um, which do not really fit any of the categories that we have. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Michali. Thank you, Heather. Um, are there perhaps any other comments or questions for Michalis? Well, uh, yeah, I'll give you a few seconds to think, but in, in the meantime, I would like to, to remind you uh, about our, our um, public lecture next week, April the 12th, is by our colleague, uh, Professor Emerita Efrosini Rizopoulou Goumenidou. Um, her lecture, her, her presentation will be in Greek. The Plio in Gipro, about in historic pragmaticotita stilaiki techni, the ship in Cyprus, from historical reality to folk art. And we are re really looking forward to that. Uh, so that is on for next week, next Monday. And we hope to see you all again next week. So uh, any, any more comments or questions, please? If not, uh, you may again switch on your cameras in case you wish to and say hello and goodbye, good night to Michalis. And thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Michalis. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for, you know, keeping me company. <laughs> Bravo, Michalis. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Hello. Congratulations. See you next week. All right. Good night, everyone.